Lesson number eight of Ephesians chapter four. So let's, uh, let's review so far some of the things that uh, we've been uh, talking about. A couple of key points that we uh, have seen. First of all, we, uh, in this uh, particular letter, Paul begins by praying that God opens their eyes, the Ephesians that is, opens their eyes so that they will be better able to appreciate the blessings of salvation. He's enumerated some of the blessings that they've had but he wants God to enable them to really appreciate what they have. So that was one of the key ideas that we've talked about. Another one, uh, Paul describes the hopeless situation of the Gentiles in the past and the glory that they now have as equal partners with the Jews as brothers in Jesus Christ and also members of his body and members of the church. So he, he focuses his attention on the Gentiles, reminds them of the very special blessings that they uh, have received through Christ. He then teaches them that salvation and their inclusion into the kingdom, meaning the Gentiles, was a plan that God kept secret from the beginning. Even the angels did not know the full details of this. Next, he also explains that God now uses the church as the medium for the revelation of this good news to all creation in heaven and on earth. Remember, the problem in Ephesus is there's, there's uh, some division going on here between the Jews, the Jews who've become Christians and the Gentiles who've become Christians. And so Paul talks to each group and he tries to remind them of all the marvelous things that God has done specifically for them in bringing them into the church. Finally, he prays that God expand their capacity to receive Christ into their hearts so that they will be totally possessed and filled with His love. You know, the idea is that if, if, if the Gentile Christians and the Jewish Christians can be filled with the love of Christ uh, and love for Christ, who else are they going to love? Well, hopefully they'll love each other and the division will be uh, abated. So with this idea, we end the second main part of the letter dealing with the universal nature of the church and we move into a discussion about the church's obligations. So he talks about the blessings that everyone has into the church, uh, in those who are in the church, talks about the specific ways that God has brought both Jew and Gentile into the church, reasons that they should be rejoicing that they are part of God's uh, church. And now he's going to move on, as I said, to a section about, well, we have all these blessings, we, we've received all these things freely from God, what are some of our obligations as members of the church? So Paul has described in great detail the things that God has done for them. In the final section, Paul will review the response of the church that God expects. Basically, he's going to talk about three obligations that the church has in response to God's wonderful plan of salvation and provision for it. So the first of these is the need to preserve unity and he's going to use up this entire chapter speaking on this point. So he, you know, basically he's saying, look, these are all the blessings you've received. How ought you to respond back to God because of these blessings? And the very first thing he's going to say about the response, you should respond with an effort to preserve unity. Remember, that was the problem he's been talking about. So the very first response he requires you know, addresses the, uh, the initial problem uh, that he addresses at the beginning. So we go to chapter four and begin reading in verse, uh, in verse one. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Many have called this section the call to unity. So he begins by exhorting them to preserve the unity that already exists and to which they, the church, were added. What unity? What unity already exists? Well, the church doesn't create unity. Unity already exists between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Their unity is perfect. When Jesus gave His life to create the church and gave His word to instruct it and the Holy Spirit to sustain it, 
He made the church part of this unified Godhead. In John 17, 21, Jesus prayed that they may be in us. Who's the they? Well, the church. And who's the us? Well, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What was He praying? That they, the church, may be unified with us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. This is a profound idea. It gives us insight into the overall plan of God. Jesus is part of the divine and unified Godhead. The church, through the cross and the word and the Holy Spirit, is part of Jesus. Therefore, the church is also, through its connection to Jesus, part of the unified Godhead. Man, that's, that's an idea that's hard to get our, you know, our brain wrapped around. And so every person, Jew or Gentile, who becomes part of the church also becomes part of this unified Godhead. I mean, a gift and a position and a blessing you know, too high for us to even imagine. Jesus, as Paul has explained, has maintained His unity with the Father and the Holy Spirit. How? Well, He's accomplished the plan of salvation. The Father sent the Son, the Son went. The Father you know, conceived the plan, the Son fulfilled the plan. The Holy Spirit empowered the Son to fulfill the plan while He was on, while he was on earth. So now Paul explains what the church must do in order to maintain its unity with Christ. You see, disunity in the church equals disunity with Jesus Christ and the Godhead. That's why it is such a serious matter. This is why unity is such an important issue. Now this is not a history class here, but if we were doing a class history on the restoration movement, of which we are a product, the whole idea is it began as a unity movement because the uh, individuals who began this and began preaching about this saw how important unity was in the church. So the threat of division at Ephesus also carried the danger of loss of unity with Christ. And so Paul begins this section by encouraging them to preserve unity and he explains how they are to do this. Not enough to say, hey, you need to preserve unity. How do we do that? So preserving the unity requires that we have a certain attitude towards one another in the church, and Paul explains what this attitude should comprise of. So at first he said, humility. You know, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility. Humility is simply the opposite of pride and vanity. Another uh, description uh, of humility is an individual who has an accurate assessment of self. Not too high, not too low, an accurate assessment of self. That's also another definition of humil uh, humility. So how do we preserve the unity? First of all, as individuals, we walk with humility. Then he says gentleness, some Bibles say meekness. A person who's meek is a person who is not self-willed. You know, my way or the highway. My way or the highway, that's not meekness. Meekness is the willingness to do it someone else's way. Patience, he says. A willingness to put up with trials and suffering and failure without losing control or cheerfulness. Another way to describe this for those in the military is patience is to be able to withstand you know, all these other things, failure, suffering, trials, without losing your bearing. I remember when our kids were in the military, it was, they used to talk about that all the time. You know, this happened, that happened, we did this training exercise. I maintained my bearing, my stature. I didn't get rattled. Some people think patience is just waiting around. I'm patient, I'm waiting. You know, hurry up, hurry up, what time are you going to get here? That's not patience. Patience begins with a willingness to put up with trials and suffering and failure. Here's the key, 
without losing control, without losing cheerfulness, without losing an attitude of love and kindness and faith, that's patience. Some people are ill. Some people are patient with their illness. Some people are not. You can tell the difference. He talks about forbearance. Forbearance or making allowance for another. The ability to not allow the action of someone else to provoke us. So he says you want to maintain unity. There are certain qualities of character that you need to cultivate. Humility, meekness, patience, forbearance. Paul tells them that in Christ, both Jew and Gentile are equally blessed, equally saved, equally precious to God. Now he exhorts them that by means of humility and patience, meekness and forbearance, they should preserve the unity of which they were made a part of when Jesus brought them into the church. The unity already exists. Our task is to maintain it. How? By cultivating these and other virtues. Then he talks about the basis of unity. As I said before, many times we confuse unity with conformity. Unity and conformity are not the same thing. Conformity is sameness. We become the same as something or someone else. McDonald's, for example. One of the key marketing things about McDonald's is conformity. You eat a Big Mac in Duluth, and you eat a Big Mac in Tampa, you eat a Big Mac in New York, you eat a Big Mac in London, you eat a Big Mac in Paris, it tastes exactly the same. Well, I don't know about Paris, they use horse meat there, but anyways, that's another issue. You know what I'm saying, conformity, you're familiar with the restaurant. That's the reason why people drive, oh, McDonald's, you know, is it haute cuisine? Of course not, but you know what you're going to get. Any state in the union, you know what you're going to get if you go to McDonald's or these other chain. That's conformity. Nothing wrong with that. But we mustn't confuse conformity with unity. Unity is the experience of sharing. That's unity. We share a similar hope. We share a similar leader. We share a similar ideal. This is the basis of unity. You know, marriage, the unity in marriage, what is it? Is it that both people are exactly the same, the same character? Of course not. Unity in marriage is that we share the same ideals, we share the same family, we share the same hopes, we share the same, perhaps, attitude in raising children. So in verses four, five, and six, Paul is going to mention seven objective elements that Christians share which serve to bring them into one unity or one unit. So let's start uh, chapter four, beginning in verse four. He says, there is one body and one spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So we're united, Paul says, because we share one body, there's only one group of the saved. There's only one church in God's eyes. You know, people say to us sometimes, oh, you think you're the only church. Well, I don't think I'm the only church, but I think I belong to the church that God recognizes as a church. I think that the Bible only recognizes that there's one church. And I share that one church with others of like mind. We have unity. He says one spirit. There's only one Spirit, the Holy Spirit, His work, His word, one Spirit. When I'm baptized and I receive forgiveness of sin, are there a multiplicity of spirits that I'm supposed to receive at that point? No, there's just one Spirit that, you know, that I'm given when I'm baptized in Christ. One hope, he says. Well, what is the one hope? Well, I hope to go to heaven. My hope is that through the sacrifice of Christ, my sins have been forgiven and I am guaranteed to live again with Christ in heaven. That's the hope, that's my hope, that's your hope. We share that hope. It's the thing that binds us together. It's the thing that unifies us. You may be a, you know, an 80-year-old woman and 
this other young man is 14 years old, you know, you're completely different, you may be a different race, culture, background, the whole thing, but you are united, why? Because you both share the one hope. He says, one Lord. Well, that, that one's easy. There's only one Lord, Jesus Christ. Even Jesus Himself said, you can't serve two. There's only one. One faith. The teachings of Jesus and the apostles. That's the one faith. That's the only faith that we have. That's what Jude is talking about uh, when he tells us to contend for the faith. It's the faith that the apostles taught in Acts chapter two. They only taught one thing. All the things that Jesus taught them, they taught the church and we continue to do so today, even in this class. One baptism, well there's only one baptism that puts us into the one body, gives us the one spirit, permits the one hope, unites us to the one Lord, taught by the one faith. I mean, there's just one baptism that does that. Baptism, immersion in water in the name of Jesus. That's that one baptism. And then he says, one God. I think I read that right. Verse six, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. There's only one God, the creator of heaven and earth. Which God, they say to me, do you worship? I said, well, I worship the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and the God who sent Jesus Christ. That's the God that I worship. Sometimes I hear people say, you know, well, Allah and, 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 and your God, they're the same God. No, they're not. God who, uh, who is the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who sent Jesus, that God didn't send Muhammad. That God didn't send Buddha. I don't know what God they're worshiping, but that's not the God of the Bible, the one God. So Paul's point with all of these is that these things, these beliefs, these responses on our part, unite us to Christ, unite us to God, and unite us to one another. They are at the center and they are what hold us together as one. For example, in baptism, I am united to Christ and through Him I'm united to God and the Holy Spirit, but I'm also united to everyone else who has experienced the same baptism, whether they're still alive and living somewhere else in the world or they have died and, 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 and are awaiting the, the judgment. When I confess that I believe that Jesus, you know, when I was 30 years old, I confess that Jesus was the Son of God and Jim met her and another Jim, I forget his last name, there were two guys for some reason or other, and uh, they immersed me in water. And on that day, I became united to Dayton, for example. Because even back in, uh, you know, in the 70s, Dayton was, uh, was preaching and doing mission work and so on and so forth, but I became united to him and I didn't even know him in those days. Why? Because at some point in his life, he shared the same baptism that, that I shared. Wait, where were you, uh, Dayton? What city, Texas? Some? Littlefield, Texas. So it was a young man in Littlefield, Texas. He obeyed the gospel. He was immersed. And many, many years later, you know what, 100 years maybe? Anyways, uh, <laughs> many years later, you know, Mike Mazzalongo from Montreal, Quebec, you couldn't get two different places, you know, as Littlefield, Texas and Montreal, Quebec, very different places. But we did the same thing for the same reason that unified us, that made us brothers. Of course, the opposite is true as well. To be divided from these things is also to be divided from Christ and each other. That's why you know, people who say, oh, doctrine is not important. Oh, doctrine is important. Absolutely, it's at the center of what unites us. So maintaining the unity that exists in the church requires a right type of attitude, humility, meekness, you know, that type of thing, towards one another and a sharing of the elements of our faith. We share the one body, we share the one spirit, the one hope, the one Lord, the one faith, the one baptism, the one God. We, all of us here, we share that together. All right, so 
In the following verses, Paul's going to talk about how God helps us to keep that unity. Of course, we're not left alone to maintain unity. God helps us with certain gifts that He provides, and Paul describes a set of gifts that we rarely perceive as gifts. In other words, he tells us we must maintain unity, he explains how to do so, and then he goes on to describe the ways that God has given us, the people, the gifts that God has given us in order to do this thing, to maintain this unity. So let's go to verse seven. He says, but to each one of us grace, there's the gift, was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when He ascended on high, He led captive a host of captives and He gave gifts to men. Now this expression, He ascended, what does it mean except that He also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is Himself also He who ascended far above all the heavens that He might fill all things. So in regards to this unity and the maintenance of it, each person has received a gift, a grace, in order to contribute to the unity. This grace, this gift, has been given by Christ to each and given according to His ability. You know when He says according to His fullness? That's according to His ability to give out these gifts. So that should be encouraging. I mean, how able is Christ to give gifts? Just how able is He, is he to give the gifts that Paul is talking about? Well, Paul quotes an Old Testament psalm, Psalm 68, that summarizes Christ's achievements on behalf of men. It's as if to say He gives gifts to men in order to help them maintain unity. And so he pretends that there's someone asking him a question and saying, well, you know, what kind of gifts? You know, and who is Jesus to give these gifts? And Paul answers, wow, he, he gives gifts according to his ability. What kind of ability does he have? Well, he quotes Psalm 68. He has died and gone to the underworld. He has resurrected and ascended to the right hand of God. His presence fills both the spiritual and the physical, uh, the, the, uh, the physical realm. And the reason he says that is to underscore how powerful Christ is to give gifts. You want to know how powerful He is to give gifts? He died. He resurrected. He is with God in heaven. He fills the spiritual world and His power fills the earthly world. That's how able He is to give. Would you like to get a gift from a person such as this? And so the point is that Jesus is able to supply abundantly the gifts needed to maintain this unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. All right, so now he keeps going. So he's saying, God doesn't leave you alone. He gives you gifts to enable you to maintain that unity. How able is he to give, uh, how able is he to give these gifts? Well, he went to the underworld, he went to heaven, he fills the spiritual realm. That's how powerful he is. All right, now in verse 11, it says, and he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers. Now in these verses, Paul describes the gifts that Christ gives. The gifts that He gives are not powers, they're people. Each gift is a gift in two ways. You have the gift to carry out the ministry as one of these people, or you receive the gift of ministry from these people. Either way, they are gifts that help the church maintain unity. And so what are the gifts he talks about? Well, he talks about apostles. That's one of the gifts that Jesus gave to the church. Messengers chosen by Christ Himself to witness the resurrection and record the New Testament. And we continue with their teaching today. Are we not studying Paul's epistle? Are we not gaining insight into the unity of the church and the you know, the life of Christ and spiritual things. Are we not learning this in 2012 today? So the gift of the apostles continues to bless us even to this day. He says he gave prophets. Now of course there were different types of prophets. Well I wouldn't say different types of prophets, but different type of ministry if you wish for prophets. In the Old Testament 
Uh, many of the prophets uh, uh, were counselors to kings, for example. Isaiah, for example, was a counselor to kings, but also foretold the future and, and uh, had the messianic prophecy far into the future in his writings. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, Agabus, for example, we don't have any of the writings of Agabus, but we have uh, 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 sections in the book of Acts that describe his ministry as foretelling what was to come in the future and guiding the church. Uh, some who were prophets uh, did not speak of things that would happen in the future. They spoke the word of God in the first century before the New Testament was recorded. They were, if you wish, living and breathing you know, epistles, living and breathing uh, individuals who were speaking directly God's, God's word. Now today, the work of the apostles and the work of the prophets is done or carried out through the scriptures. The prophets uh, and the apostles have already made their record and this record has been providentially kept and maintained uh, and handed down to us uh, to this day. Today we have the word of God uh, 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 fulfilling the ministry of the apostles, the word of God fulfilling the ministry of the prophets in the first century. But we have other gifts that God continually gives to the church, evangelists, those who proclaim the gospel, Philip, for example, was one of these in Acts chapter eight. The uh, evangelists like Timothy and Titus who organized and established uh, churches, uh, they were there to promote unity. And then he says pastors or elders, if you wish, bishops and teachers, elders who shepherd by teaching, Acts chapter 20, and those who teach the word but are not necessarily uh, appointed to the role of shepherd, Acts chapter 13, for example. There were teachers there. Uh, so these were gifts, even today, because their role and their abilities come from God. It's a humbling thing to serve as an elder or as a preacher, because the calling is from God. The ministry is from God. Not self-proclaimed uh, evangelists, but evangelists who have been appointed by the church elders who have been appointed by the church, teachers who have been appointed by the church. No such thing as a self-appointed evangelist, no such thing as a self-appointed elder or deacon or anything like that. God always works through His church. All right, verse 12 and 13, continue the thought. He says, uh, for the, uh, so he says, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man, to the measure of stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. A long sentence here. One of those sentences where we understand the words, but by the time we finished reading it, we're thinking, oh yeah, what did he say again? It's one of those. Basically, Paul is saying their work consists of building up the church and maintaining that unity that Paul speaks of at the beginning of the chapter. We're already united because Christ is united in the Godhead. Our responsibility is to maintain that unity. God uh, helps us develop those personal virtues that work towards that, humility, meekness, so on and so forth. God also provides individuals, gifts to the church that promote and help and build up that unity. And how do they do this? How do those pastors, elders, uh, teachers, how do they do this? Well, they supply each saint what he or she needs to serve others in the body and thus promote the unity. And serve the body to achieve what goal? Well, to achieve perfect unity in Christ. What are we shooting for? Again, are we shooting for conformity? Well, to a certain degree we are, but unity goes beyond that. We're trying to achieve perfect unity. So what is perfect unity? Well, unity of the faith, that we all understand the same thing about what the scripture teaches, and we have accurately you know, uh, found what the scripture teaches, and all of us understand it, and all of us trust, the unity of the faith. We all have equal faith that the sacrifice of Christ is sufficient to save us. Unity of relationships, 
all of us have strength in our unity with Christ. We're not doubting, we're not afraid, and we also have unity with one another. You know, when someone becomes an elder, one of the things they don't, you know, they think that elders meetings are just meetings about you know, stuff, you know, what color, we're going to spend money on this, we're going to do that, but elders meetings many times are putting out fires and one of the things that happens over and over again in a congregation is brothers and sisters are divided against each other. Somebody says something that offends somebody else. Somebody does something that steps on somebody else's toes, whatever. A lot of the work of leadership in the church of putting out these fires, helping brothers and sisters to come back to be unified in the faith. That's why someone who causes disunity in the church is disfellowship. It's a very serious sin. And of course, unity of service. Uh, that we're all together in promoting the gospel and love. So Christ gives these people to the church so they will serve the church in helping it mature in every phase of unity. Unfortunately, it is these very same people sometimes who create disunity. The worst thing in the world is when it's one of the elders who's causing the trouble or one of the preachers who's preaching the wrong thing. Then there's lots of trouble. So what are the results of unity? I only got five minutes, we need to move. He says, as a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. So what are the results? Very quickly, first of all, that everyone is firmly planted in the word, that we're not easily seduced by lies and tricks and plans of evil uh, men. Another result of this work, that we're able to speak the truth in love. No gossip or division or hypocrisy. The ability to speak the word to the lost and those who are struggling. Uh, maturity in Christ, another result of the work of these leaders. Become like Jesus in our attitude and character and our unity with God and each other. And then cooperation in mutual service. You know, the idea is, I'll give you a kind of a strange image here. Think of, imagine a little baby. A little baby, say a year old, okay? A one year old baby with the head of an adult. Seems a little strange, doesn't it? Well, this is what Paul is saying here. The head's already formed. The head is Christ. What has to happen is that body has to grow up to match the head. This is, and these you know, elders, preachers, so on and so forth, they've been, given, they've been given to the church to help each joint grow so that eventually the body will match the head, which is Christ Jesus. Of course, like conformity, there is also a downside to the pursuit of unity. The cost of unity, discomfort. Discomfort. It's not easy maintaining love and patience and gentleness and forbearance with someone you disagree with about the one Lord, the one faith, and the one baptism. That's why conformity is so appealing. Everybody agrees or they're out. You know, it's easy to get along with people who agree with you on everything. But God says we need to make an effort to maintain unity through peace since He knows, or He knew rather, that it wouldn't be easy. It's not easy to maintain unity in the church because we're not all, the same, we're not all at the same maturity level. We've been taught different things. Many of you have come from different religions or no religion. I mean, in Montreal, here, you know, somebody said, well, I used to be a Baptist, or I used to be a Methodist, or I used to be this and that. You know, at least some of the basics are there. In Montreal, I used to be a Buddhist, I used to be an atheist, I used to be a communist. I, you know, there, was a, there was a great disparity of faith and belief in that group. That was, it was quite a task to maintain unity there. Unity is difficult because we're sinful and our sins limit our understanding. Unity is difficult because we've misunderstood what we've been taught or we have prejudices. So it's not easy to get along, to be patient, loving towards those who don't agree with us. But making the effort to maintain unity despite these obstacles is the true test of our discipleship because Jesus said, 
your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples, John 13, 35. Notice he didn't say how big a group you are will prove that you're my disciples or that you know all the same, you know, that you're all the same will prove or that you know all the doctrines by heart will prove or you think you're right will prove or that you're very motivated will prove. All those who confess Christ and were buried in baptism have been added to the divinely united circle that includes the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and now the church. The greatest task that we have as Christians, I mean, aside from preaching the gospel, I mean the task within, the greatest task we have as Christians is to maintain that unity, that oneness, by loving one another despite our differences. That's the task that's been set before us within the church. Okay, that's our class for today. Thank you for your attention.